to be here today we're going to speak about robots and if we have to speak about robots we have to speak about science fiction clicker doesn't work let me do this that that this yes science fiction anybody like science fiction here one person two person four okay that's pretty good all right I can't work with that science fiction what is science fiction? Well, when you research science fiction, you notice that nobody knows exactly what science fiction is. I even know a writer who says science fiction is what I say science fiction is. So I cannot really provide you with a definition for science fiction. But what I can do is explain a little bit about the main question that science fiction is doing. I'm trying this presentation to be smooth, but as you can see, technology doesn't help me. So the idea of science fiction is to unlock the brain with questions. In the beginning, science fiction started at the end of the 19th century because people came up with the idea that technology and science could save humankind. They came up with this idea which was quite new because before we thought that only religion or philosophy could save us. If you behave well, then religion say, well, you will go to heaven or we go to hell. And science was also something quite new for people to believe in. So science fiction is this mix of those two beliefs, the idea that slowly mankind can be saved through science and technology. I'm saying this, this was the beginning, because today it's quite different as we will see. So when I explain science fiction, I say that mostly science fiction is the art of asking questions, especially the most important question, which is what if? There we go, what if? Maybe I should be here, guys, for technological purpose. What if? Asking the question, what if? What if, for instance, cars could fly? What if the world that you know is not real? What if you were living in a universe mostly populated by robots? That's what science fiction can do. I know that usually science fiction sounds very nerdy, very geeky, or people who understand the jokes of the Big Bang Theory think that, well, they know science fiction, they understand it. Science fiction is quite serious, as we will see today, but it's also quite fun. What I want to show with science fiction is First of all, I'm going to focus just on robots. I was asked today to speak only about robots, so I will focus on this. The idea of robots, which is central in science fiction, is to help us understand not so much robots, but mostly us. Because science fiction is also very, very useful to understand ourselves. Science fiction is going to present us, present us with the others. The others being aliens, being robots, being creatures, which are extremely different from us, and therefore can help us understand better who we are. But the birth of robot, let's speak about the birth of robot, where they come from. First of all, the term that we use today, robot, is coming from this play that was written in 1920 by Karel Čapek in the Czech Republic. And it's a play about creatures, man-made creatures, which are supposed to be servants. Robot means servant in, in, in Czech. But slowly they're going to understand that maybe there is something better than serving humans. But that is the origin of the term robot. Now, we had robots before, but they had different names, like automats. Especially in France and Great Britain, we were always fascinated with the idea that maybe we could also create creatures. Now, probably the most important author to know when it comes to robots is Isaac Asimov. Asimov is some kind of genius. He was born in Russia, he immigrated to the United States. He wrote 500 books, if you can believe it, about pretty much anything. He wrote books about the Bible, about crossword puzzle, but mostly he wrote about science fiction. And he wrote about, um, he wrote this trilogy called The Robots. And in the trilogy, he's talking about the laws of robotics. In the beginning, only three laws of robotics, three laws. And then later on, he came up with number zero, very binary. If you look at those laws, you can see that the laws of robotics by Asimov state that robots are there to serve humankind. They're not supposed to attack humankind. They're supposed to help us. They must obey the orders. They must protect us. And they also must protect themselves if it means that they're not harming a human being. 
These laws are interesting and important because for years, for decades, they were the laws used by Department of Robotics all over, over the world. Most scientists believe that those laws should be applied to robots, in a sense that robots should always serve humankind. But things have changed. Things have changed. And today, for, so that we can be on the same page, I wanted to define a robot. And the thing is, not everybody once again agree on what a robot is. Real imaginary machine controlled by a computer, often made to look like a human animal, that's too restrictive. Machine that can do the work of a person that works automatically or is controlled by a computer, once again, very restrictive. It's like defining a human. Defining a robot is very, very complex. Not everybody agrees on what robot is. Today, actually, I'm going to sort of mix together robot and artificial intelligence together. But the robots, if you look at science fiction, in the beginning, robot is always a servant. The robot is always a creature that is made to serve us. If you look at one of the first robot ever in Metropolis, Maria, she's supposed to serve humankind. Metropolis is this amazing movie, 1927. If you should watch one movie of science fiction, that will probably be Metropolis, produced in Germany by Fritz Lang, directed by Fritz Lang. And Metropolis, Maria is supposed to actually save humankind, hence the name Maria. Later on, uh, in the golden age of um, American science fiction, the Day the Earth Stood Still, maybe you've seen the reboot with Keanu Reeves, not the best one ever, but The Day the Earth Stood Still, those aliens come to Earth in 1951, and they only mean peace, and they want to speak with us, and of course, what do we do? Well, we shoot at them, because we don't like foreigners, right? So this robot, Gort, is also supposed to protect the alien that came, uh, came on Earth with peace, and uh, well, we're going to shoot at him, and he's going to destroy us. But still, he's considered a servant. Moving on. Forbidden Planet, um, I like the design of Robbie. Robbie, as you can see here, is also designed to protect this lovely woman, which is the daughter of a mad scientist who invented him. Robbie is also uh, a robot that is designed to serve humanity. Astro Boy, I don't know if you know Astro Boy, super kitsch, I love it. Astro Boy is a mix, is an interesting mix between a robot and superhero. He was created in the 60s in Japan, and he's a robot that is supposed to protect the whole of Tokyo. So it's a mix of Superman, and, uh, and robot. Star Wars. How many of you guys have seen Star Wars? I'm always very curious. All right. I'm mentioning Star Wars, but it's not science fiction, all right? Star Wars is not science fiction. Star Wars is taking place a long time ago in a galaxy far away. So basically, we would say it's not science fiction. But still, it's interesting to notice that once again, those robots coming from the past, not from the future, R2-D2 and C-3PO, they're also supposed to save mankind. C-3PO speaks uh, 6 million dialects or something, I don't know. And R2-D2 is also very efficient if uh, your starship is broken. Now, I wanted to mention this one also, the step of the wise, because speaking about servant, there's also this ultimate fantasy when it comes to robots, that they can truly be the best servant in the world. In 1975, this movie was released in the United States, The Stepford Wives. I don't know if you've seen this movie, but it's about this very weird place, ideal place, where men who are a, bit, a little bit stressed go. And um, in this village, in this place, the women are replaced by robots. Because in the end, robots are the perfect women. I want to show you the trailer of the reboot in 2004, starring Nicole Kidman. This is your life. Everything you own is beautiful. Perfectly constructed. Ideally manufactured. Everything you possess feels, thinks, and responds as if you had it made just for you. Isn't it time you had the ultimate imperfection? For the man who has everything. The Stepford Wives. Make one. Some assembly required. <laughs> so.
So if you think you have everything, you probably don't have Nicole Kidman as a robot that will serve your ultimate fantasy. But the thing is robots, like I said, I'm going to sort of mix it with artificial intelligence, the idea that we can also create intelligent beings. And the thing is robots, because we don't like dumb bots. Well, I know that the example of Nicole Kidman may not be the best one, but robots cannot be dumb all the time. They also have to take initiative. If they really want to be good servants, they have to be able to think by themselves. And science fiction is going to reflect this slowly. 2001, I would say the second classic of science fiction, the second classic of, of American science fiction. In 2001, amazing movie. We start with the dawn of humanity, and we end up understanding where we come from. In 2000 Space Odyssey, there is this one computer, this artificial intelligence. It's also a robot because it can operate all through a starship. Hal is going to decide that for the sake of mankind, he has to kill people. He has to kill the astronaut that he's supposed to protect. And it's quite new because before, we're under the impression that robots being servants were supposed to help us and protect us. And in 2001, 1968, we wake up and we discover that robots actually are also out there to kill us. That's not the only thing. Blade Runner 1982, probably my favorite movie of all time. In Blade Runner, we are in a future, but not so distant future. In 2019, we're able to invent those Nexus 6 perfect robots, androids and gunoid that look exactly like us. They go on foreign uh, planets. They do the dirty job that we don't like. They explore, they fight, they also fuck. You have some robot prostitutes. But the thing is, they are so smart. They are much faster than us, much stronger. They do everything better. They are also smarter than us. And they want to be like us. They are tired of serving humanity. They want to be like us, and they want to know what is the secret of humanity. Terminator, of course, is an example that probably everybody knows. There will be another movie coming pretty soon, Terminator Genesis. But a Terminator, as you probably all know the story, Terminator is a robot from the future which is sent today in order to kill Sarah Connor and everybody who is standing between him and her. The Terminator is yet another robot that is supposed to serve mankind, but is killing people. But this idea that robots, in the end, can also think that robots, if we design them to look like us in a very biblical way, those robots, I, th I found probably the best example in this Swedish show. Because you probably noticed that so far I spoke mostly about American science fiction. That's the thing. Today, most of the science fiction is produced in the United States. Most of the science fiction is produced in the United States. I'm speaking mostly about movies. There is an amazing amount of movies produced in the United States about science fiction. And the reason why I started SHIFT is that today there are absolutely no movie, no Dutch movie about science fiction. There is not one movie about science fiction produced in the Netherlands. doesn't mean that there is no science fiction in the Netherlands, but not a single movie about science fiction was produced in the Netherlands. And I think it's quite concerning because probably you guys wouldn't like it if Hollywood was remaking your past, if Hollywood was making movies about the past of the Netherlands and bashing you. Well, probably one day will come when they will do it. They've done that for France, they've done that for Britain, pr for pretty much every country. But it seems that people are okay with the fact that Hollywood is rewriting the past, but also that Hollywood is writing the future. And in most countries which do not produce science fiction, it seems to be okay that another country is deciding for your future, is drawing your future. So I was very happy to discover this uh, TV show called Ekta Maniskor, which means real humans. And it's one of the most challenging TV show I know. Because most questions about robots have been asked in the previous movies that I briefly showed you. But this movie is going even further. In Ekta Maniskor, the idea is that robots today are produced. They look exactly like us. You have several levels of intelligence for those robots. Some can just cook. Some can just uh, help elder people. But some can be extremely, extremely intelligent, very, very smart. So the show is constantly asking questions that we would never have thought about. For instance, if a robot is helping you, let's say, in your job, is he supposed to get a contract? If you marry a robot, first of all, can you marry a robot? And if you marry this robot and let's say you die, which is one of the episodes, can the robot take care of your children? Or is it just going to be just another machine? Now, of course, the first reaction of people when you say, well, can a robot like, have a passport, a contract, or take care of children is that it's just a machine. But the interesting thing is that this movie is coming from Sweden. Sweden has always been forward when it comes to civil rights. 
And part of the idea is to make you think about this idea of civil rights. You know that today, well, gay marriage, even in France, we have gay marriage. It's completely okay. But back in the day, providing civil rights to homosexuals was something that was deemed completely blasphemous. Even according to the right to vote for women was something that men would not think about. So it may sound a bit far-fetched to think already about the future and that when robots will be there and they look like us and they work like us and they have sexual intercourse with us, well, what should we do? Should we consider them to be equal or should we still consider them to be machines? But yet again, science fiction is there to help you think about the future, to prepare the future, to invent the future, and also to prevent the future. So this is a great show because it's going to make you think once again, not so much about the robots, but about yourself. I have a clip for you, and it's dubbed, it's actually subtitled in Dutch. Graceful, elegant, efficient. Did your life just get longer? Good morning. We would also get a new one. Can he handle heart and lung treatment? akut sjukvård och sist men inte minst är en utpräglad sällskapsrobot för de lite mer ensamma kvällarna. Hej. Men herregud, du läser väl tidningen? De används som sexleksak. Jag vet inte, jag kan tycka de är lite söta också. Jag har hittat tre förstörda robotar. Och alla med det märket bara. Det klunkar sig en del om självgående. Och kanske till och med vilda grupper av robotar som kan ta hand om varandra. Det har väl ryktat sen längre tid om vilda robotar, men jag skulle kunna Vi tro... Vi anledning att tro att han kan ha lyckats. För vildade maskiner med en intelligens långt högre än någon av oss. Vad gör du med den här jävla dockan? Stullar den igen, eller? Det skulle vara bättre om du gör det. Hon träffar någon annan. En robot. Ni två damer är välkomna, men inte Pacman här. Bara för att vi inte föddes ur en kvinna ska vi behandlas som motorcyklar. Men snart är vi ju bara några hundra människor kvar. Fattar ni inte? Vakna! Det är ju snart vi som jobbar för dem! Vad är du? Vi åker. Det är inte säkert, va? In that case, I mean, technically she's a machine, but she behaves like a human. So why is she supposed to do press charges for sexual harassment? That's the kind of question that the show is asking. Now, today I was asked to speak about robots. And since I know that everybody's creative here in this room, I was thinking about what robots can do in a creative way. And being French, of course, I'm obsessed with food. And I was thinking, can robot cook for us? Because I was asked in the beginning, well, in the interview, uh, what kind of robot would you like? And I was thinking very hard, and I was thinking, well, probably like a robot that can cook for me would definitely be the bomb. So can robots cook for us? Well, according to this TV commercial from England, they can. Meet Sally. Hello. What can I do for you today? The help you've always wanted. She is faster, stronger, more capable than ever before. Sally is part of your family, a teacher, this is a real commercial a that was broadcast on Channel 4 a few weeks ago. A friend. New generation persona synthetics, closer to humans than ever So they will have before. the Regent Street store open pretty soon. It's called Persona Synthetic. It's a real company. Are you impressed? Are you scared? So far, well, they haven't seen exactly what it's all about, but it seems that it's more like a reboot of real humans for the British market. And the British are very good when it comes to advertising their own show. But still, a lot of people, when they show the commercial on Channel 4, they were scared to death. They called Channel 4 saying, what the hell is happening? I would being taken over by robots. What the hell is happening? Is, Obama, is, is Osama bin Laden back? People were scared because when you see robots, we think about robots taking over the world because we use to this by science fiction. We also think that robots will, be, will at least take our jobs. I remember that last time I spoke about robots, it was at UMIT, University of Leiden. And one person came to me, a journalist, came straight and said, but aren't you scared that robots will take over our jobs? And I say, well, the thing is, for you as a journalist, most deaf. Your job will be taken over. Because today, robots are already out there and they are writing stories as well as you do, unfortunately. Even Wikipedia is written by robots. Well, not everything, but at least, if I remember correctly, 12% of all Wikipedia entries are written by robots. 
So of course, we're scared of robots. We're very scared of robots. But they can, they, well, they can interact. They will very soon be able to interact with us. They're getting smarter and smarter. There's this test called the Turing test, which is trying to determine if someone is a computer or a human. And so far, every time, the computers were failing. This year, for the first time, a robot, an AI, was able to fool humans, pretending that he was a human for the first time. So robots are getting smarter and smarter. They are getting smarter and smarter, and robots are there to happen. But can they cook? So far, this is the best we can do when it comes to cooking with a robot. And I show this to my wife. She's Dutch. And she was like, yes, pancake bot. I've been waiting for you my whole life. And I was like, holy shit, are you serious? Pancake bot? That's what you want? I think it's pretty, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not very excited by pancake bot. But I have to say I'm more excited by this. IBM, you all know IBM, this giant company. And IBM is always working on supercomputers. And during the Cold War, they came up with this computer called Big Blue. And Big Blue was the first computer that could beat a human playing chess. He beat Garry Kasparov. And it was something very scary because we all thought that you know, beating a human at chess was impossible. Because chess is not about logic. Chess is also about gambit, for instance. Sometimes you're going to lose a little bit to gain a lot. And we thought that a machine could never understand this. Today, I think um, it's been 10 years that a human could not defeat the, the, the descent of Big Blue. Today, the computers are getting smarter and smarter, and today it's impossible to beat them at chess. And so IBM decided to release another very scary bot called Watson. And Watson is the robot, well, it's a program, call it however you want, artificial intelligence, that can design recipes. He can actually design its own recipes, which means that he's going to think about all the recipes. You're going to feed the computer with a bunch of recipes, and he's going to design his own. And one of them is plum pancetta cider. That doesn't sound good. But the way Watson is, is working is he's going to analyze all the recipes, see what works, and consider cooking to be just like chemistry. So Watson is going to cook. That's what he's going to do. And Momentum Machines is this time a real company working on robots that can definitely cook, that can actually, that you can put in your kitchen and they will cook for you. And those machines are going to look pretty much like this. This is real, my friends, this is real. In a sense that maybe one day you will have this in your kitchen. And those robotic arms, well, the way they cook is actually by imitating a real chef. So first of all, they're going to learn looking at a real chef, looking at somebody who knows how to cook, and then they're going to reproduce all the gestures for you. And maybe they will also use some of the recipes by Watson. It is possible today because, as you know, well, that's something in France we're very concerned. It's called molecular cuisine. I don't know if you heard of this. El Bulli was considered to be the best restaurant in the world by a British magazine. So, yeah. And El Bulli is about molecular cuisine, the sense that they're going to consider cuisine not as an art like we do, but as just chemistry. Like, you know, what's going to happen if I mix asparagus and this and that? Now, fortunately, El Bulli was closed because way too people had diarrhea. Because the thing is, they were playing with chemistry. But when you play with chemistry, for instance, they had this ice cream where they were condensing uh, olive oil. Now, I don't know about you, but I use olive oil sometimes when, you know, I need to let go. What's happening if you concentrate olive oil 200 times? Well, you go very, very fast. And that's the thing. Most people, after going to El Bulli, Understand that El Bulli was, uh, you had to wait six months to have a table, and a meal will cost probably 200 euros. So imagine the face of people going there, waiting six months, paying 200 euros, and then ending up with diarrhea. But still, it seems that today people accept more and more the idea that cuisine is not art, that cuisine is actually just chemistry. So that's the question that we have to debate today. Can robots create? Is it possible for robots to create? We make them intelligent. We make them very smart. We also want them to do the chores that we don't like to do, OK? So maybe in the end, we also want the robots to create for us. We know that animals can create. We know that some cats, some elephants, some very smart animals can create. Also recently, in this South African movie called Chappie, it was said that, well, if you explain art to a robot, then in the end, it can also reproduce what art is, just by reproducing. And maybe by reproducing, he will be able to learn. But once again, it's just reproducing. What about this? What about music? Music. 
So this piece was designed completely by a robot. And it was played by the London Symphony Orchestra in 2012. So this was not made by a human. This was made by a robot, by a machine, by a computer, call it however you want, by an intelligence that is not human. I think this piece is interesting because some people will like it. People like Philip Glass, maybe they will enjoy it. Some people will not like it. But the main question is, are we in the future robots will create? They will create because in the end, creating is also reproducing, imitating, um, and robots can do this. We know robots can do this. So in the end, we're going to have more arts created by robots. We'll have books written by robots. We'll have design completely made by robots. We'll have music, we already have music made by robots. Are we going to consider it on the same level as human art? Are we going to consider robot creativity to be the same as, uh, as <coughs> sorry, uh, robot creativity? That's what I have for you today. I would like to take some questions. I also would like to remind you that we have Shift. We need you in the sense that Shift is open to absolutely everyone. We have many people interested in thinking about the future in the Netherlands. We had a first Shift talk last week. We need people interested in the future. We need people interested in science fiction. And people like you who are very creative, we would love to have you also working with us with Shift. Thank you very much for your attention. That's all I have to you today. And now we have some questions, I believe. <laughs> and I